All right, good morning, everybody. So thanks for joining uh, um, this month's webinar. The topic for today is special allocations. Um, if this is the first time you're joining us for our webinars, just to give you a little heads up, uh, we have a lot of people on. Um, and because of that, I do mute everybody. Uh, if you have questions at any time throughout the webinar, I ask that you email them to our help desk, uh, crc at pennyatworks.com. At the end of my presentation, um, I'll take a look at what's come in and try to answer uh, everything I can. If I don't get to your question on the actual webinar, I'll be reaching out to you um, later today to answer any questions. Also remember, uh, these are taped recordings. And we post them to our extranet, as well as on YouTube and on Vimeo. So if you like it and want to watch it again, or uh, if you don't get a chance to uh, make one of our webinars one month, know that we do record them, and they're up there for you to view anytime. OK. So special allocations. In Penny, uh, the main al uh, default allocation is capital. So just for the system as a whole, anytime you do an allocation, unless otherwise specified, Penny's going to use capital. But being an allocation system, uh, you need additional flexibility. As we all know, there are certain months or just certain funds where you have pieces of income uh, that need to be specially allocated. So there's a lot of flexibility in the system. We're going to cover the different ways to do it. but. Overall, anytime you do a special allocation, it's a two-step process. The first step is defining how the P&L should be allocated, who gets it. The second step is defining what piece of P&L. For the most part, everything we're going to be talking about is found under the period tab. So fund period, we have here the fund allocation pencils. So first thing, we're going to start with the how. And we're going to start with the fund allocation override. Now the fund allocation override, this is used, um, you can use this any month. It is time sensitive, uh, a period needs to be specified. So this is really good for that one-off allocation. So if we take a look at the setup screen, when you enter in the regular fund allocation override, you give it a code and a description. It is specific to the fund and a period. Note that when uh, you're allocating to a specific period, the beginning period processing must be done. The reason being, you need to know who's in the fund to allocate to. This can be segregated out by group. So if you select a group, only the investors in that group are going to appear. If you do it for the fund as a whole, these are all the investors I have in this fund. You can set up the allocation three different ways. You can use percent, in which, in this case, I have an easy example. I have 100% going to one investor. Uh, when you use percent, just note they must total 100%. Another method is to use capital. Now this is different than regular just using capital because when the system uses capital, it uses the entire capital of the fund. And what this does is allow you to use capital but only for certain investors. So what Penny will do is it will look, if I say use capital for these two investors, it will take the total capital for LP1, the total capital for LP number two, and create percentages based on LP's share of that combined capital. If you're doing, um, uh, just leaving one person out, there is a button select all in which everyone will be selected to make it easier. Then you can just uncheck someone as opposed to clicking through a million investors. You also have unselect all. Makes life a little bit easier. And then the third option is basis. Now basis is when if you, uh, especially if maybe you're working off of uh, an Excel spreadsheet and you know the exact numbers you want to allocate, Instead of doing the math and coming up with the percentage, you can just put the numbers you want uh, going to each investor directly in. It does not need to total 100. And what Penny will do is do the math and create the percentage from that. Now, one item to note, when you're doing these and filling out the percentages or using a basis, um, I recommend using positive numbers. Because whether you're going to allocate 
uh, income or expense, that's defined in step two when we define what P&L should be allocated. This is just coming up with the percentages. So you always just want to use positive numbers and you never want to mix. You never want to have uh, you know, $50 one way and negative 25 the other. That's a no-no. So you always just want to have nice, clean, positive numbers. And again, when you total 100%, no negatives, just uh, positive numbers. Now, one thing I want to point out, this is an LP fund. Um, so uh, you can see the actual, I'm not very creative with my names, but you can see the names of the investors and you can allocate by investor. When you're doing share-based funds, just note the allocations are always done at the series level. And the reason being is because each class in series has to have the same NAV across, so you would never have a special allocation just to certain members within a class in series. So when you do it for a share-based fund, you'll note that the allocation method um, where you can put your uh, same percentage, capital, or basis is at the series level. So this is great for that one-off allocation, but because you have to have it uh, period specific, you would have to enter this in every month. Now we all know we have funds where they just every single month it's a same special allocation. And you don't want to have to manually go in and create it every month. So what we offer is the fund allocation recurring. What this allows you to do is I say if there's a rhyme or reason to your allocation, if you can define uh, the parameters for how it's allocated, this is where you should go. Now this has a little bit more flexibility because it's not time sensitive. So there's several tabs. You have your main tab. You can choose the base of which to allocate. So you can still do capital, you can do cost, or you can do commitment. You can limit on. So you can limit on a group if you have a um, group set up. You can also limit on region, new issue, and type. Now what those are, if we take a minute to go into the investor setup, region is your investor region, new issue and type, you have new issue and type. So when you go and you set up your investors, you can create buckets uh, of various investors by type or by investor region that then you can create uh, fund allocations based off of. Now these are system um, types right here. Uh, there are times when perhaps you want something a little more customized. So we also offer on the allocation recurring, you'll have also include and also exclude. And what you can do here is through the use of custom fields, you can tag investors into groups for these special allocations. So for example, if I go back to this investor, I have a custom field for special, special people or regular people. So on my allocation, I can actually select the values so that I can create a special allocation based on these custom fields at the investor level. So this allows you to get a little creative and create um, fund allocations that you can use for recurring months. Um, and again, you have also include and also exclude, and that's your preference if you have a fund with you know 500 investors and you just want to leave one person out, exclude the one. And again, if you know, if it's easier to just include certain people. You can also filter by role. So you can create an allocation that just goes to three different roles, one different role, two different roles. You can get creative here as well. And the nice thing about this is it is a dynamic allocation. So as you book contributions and withdrawals and move people in and out of these roles, the uh, special allocation here, the fund allocation recurring, will update for those changes. So you can do by roles and you can also do by series. Now to make life even a little easier, the system actually sets up some allocations on its own. 
If you'll ever notice, when you do, in, for example, investor groups, if I open up an investor group, there's, there's a box, Create Allocation. So if you check that box, it's going to automatically create an allocation method for the people in that group. Another one is on the investor role. Again, the box create allocation. So by checking this box, you're automatically creating an, uh, an allocation method specific to that investor role. So that answers the first question of, you know, how should the P&L be allocated? Now the second part is, what P&L? What are we allocating? So that we use the fund allocation default. Now, whether using your fund allocation override or recurring, there's just one allocation default. So here you select your fund and your period. When you select a period, you're going to get more choices for your allocation because you're going to get any type of fund allocation override you did for that uh, specific period, and you're also going to get any of the system-generated allocations and your recurring allocations. So in this case, I have my fund, I have my period, I created, uh, I chose my special uh, allocation, and here's where you define what P&L, through the account and the subaccount. So when you're doing special allocations, you always want to make sure the piece of P&L you're allocating is in its own uh, bucket. So you can do that through the use of an account, a subaccount, or a combination. You can leave them blank, so just for an example, if you leave account none, it's going to apply it to every single account. If you leave subaccount none, it'll apply it to every single subaccount. So you can get creative and say, I'm going to do, uh, you know, account 8100, any subaccount within that is going to use this allocation method. So it's through the account and the subaccount that you define uh, what P&L is going to be specially allocated. Now we talked about recurring. What's nice about the recurring is it is dynamic and it changes on its own. So what you can do is hit ignore period. By hitting ignore period, you're telling the system, I'm going to use this every single month. Every time there's a period, I'm going to use this allocation. So that's why when you check this box, anything you've set up for fund allocation overrides is not going to appear because that is time sensitive. And what you're going to get when you choose your fund is your allocations that you set up your recurring allocations or your uh, system-generated ones. So anything for a group, anything for an investor role. And so once you choose that, so general allocation, this was the recurring allocation I'd set up. Once you save, that's it. Now the system knows uh, it will keep track of the people in that um, recurring allocation and it will apply it to that account and subaccount combination every month. So it is a set it and forget it. Um, which does make life uh, a lot easier because um, then you set it up once and you don't have to worry about it. Now, because you need to uh, specify the account and subaccount for these special allocations, I just want to talk about estimates a little bit. With our estimate functionality, um, the special allocations do work. But again, because you need to tag that specific um, P&L, uh, you actually need to book, instead of on the, um, on the estimate screen, you can normally enter in uh, P&L through the, the screen. Um, if you need that P&L specially allocated, you'll actually need to do a journal entry to the account and subaccount. But when you process the estimate, it will, um, if the default is set up, it will pull it in and do the special allocation for your estimate. So the special allocations are set up, everything's processed, so let's check and see um, to make sure the system um, used the allocations you wanted. So one of the things I like to point out is in the general journal, I'm going to pull up some P&L here, uh, a journal entry, and you'll notice there's a, a section fund allocation. This is the method that's used for the specific line of P&L. So you can see in this journal entry, 
capital's not being used. It's my Kristen test allocation for uh, this account subaccount and general allocation for this account and subaccount. So on the journal, um, on the journal entry itself, you can see what allocation is being applied um, to the P&L. One thing to note: if you have your journal entry in first, and then you set up your allocation in default, you're always going to want to go back and resave your journal entry so that it will trigger um, to use the correct default allocation. Another good report to use is the investor income report. Now, if you do this by allocation, this is now going to show you the breakdown by allocation of P&L. Because if you just run your regular partner capital report or investor capital report, it's going to show you just the total P&L per investor. What this report will do is break it apart. So you'll actually see here I have a special allocation. This is the one I set up that 100% went to LP number four. You can actually see the amount that is booked um, and the allocation. Okay, at this time I'm just gonna check and see if any questions have come in. Okay, this one is a little specific, but um, it's a good example. The question is, is there a way to set the default to use just commitments instead of capital? And this would be for private equity funds. Um, there isn't a way to just uh, flip a switch for uh, all of Penny. Penny's always going to use capital, but what you can do is through the recurring um, fund allocation, if you set up something to base on commitment, and then set your default, and let's say you, you took your fund, ignore period, um, selected that allocation, and just left everything blank. Then every single piece of P&L is going to use your commitment percentages to allocate. So that is a, a way to get around changing the system so that every piece, um, no matter what account and sub-account, you don't have to worry about creating a bunch of different uh, special allocations. You can just set everything up to allocate on commitment. That was actually the only question we have today. So I want to say thank you very much. Um, this concludes our webinar for this month. Join us again next month. Uh, we're going to be doing another webinar on batch reporting. So if you haven't yet RSVP, just shoot me an email uh, and we'll get you signed up for that. And again, this is recorded, so uh, feel free. We'll uh, post this up to our extranet as well as on YouTube and on Vimeo. So thank you very much. Talk to you next month.